Hello friends, welcome back to the SNW audio channel. In today's video, we continue with the SNW BFA01 project and will conclude the design of the amplifier's input network. More precisely, we will assign values to the network's components, select the components from DigiKey, and will evaluate the performance of the network using LTSpice. In the last video, we went over the topology for the input network, which is shown on the left-hand side of the page. The transfer function for this network, which I derived using node equations, is shown right here. Note that I ignored R3 in the derivation, because R3 is going to be fairly small relative to R1 and R2. The transfer function that I obtained is actually a bit messy and it's hard to work with, but if we make a conscious design choice of choosing R2 to be much larger than R1, then the transfer function simplifies and factors nicely as shown down here. You will see that this choice is actually a natural choice when we assign the values later in the video. The result of the factor transfer function should not come as a surprise. Rearranging the equation, we can see the high pass filter formed by C2 and R2, AC coupling is essentially a high pass filter, and we can also see the low pass filter formed by R1C1. Like all RC circuits, the associated time constants for these filters are R2C2 and R1C1 respectively. Let's take a quick detour and go over how to calculate the cutoff frequency for RC circuits. The formula for the cutoff frequency is 1 over the product of 2 pi and the time constant. More precisely, 1 over 2 pi RC. Now, what most people do to calculate this frequency is punch in the values into a calculator and get the results. Doing this once or twice is okay, but it will get old and tedious very fast. A much better way to calculate the cutoff frequency is to do the scaling method. In this method, you learn the result from one combination of R and C, and then scale from there. I like to use R equals 1K and C equals 1 picofarad, resulting in a cutoff frequency of 160 MHz as my reference value, but you can choose any two values that you like. Once you have chosen a reference value, then you just scale from there, knowing that increasing either R and C will reduce the cutoff frequency proportionally, and vice versa, meaning reducing either R or C will increase the frequency proportionately also. To see how this works, let's go through an example. Let's start with my reference value of R equals 1K and C equals 1 picofarad, resulting in a cutoff frequency of 160 MHz. If we increase the capacitor by a factor of 1000, such that R equals 1K and C equals 1 nanofarad, we're going to get 160 kHz, 1000 times slower cutoff frequency. Now, if we reduce the resistor by a factor of 10, such that R equals 100 ohms and C equals 1 nanofarads, then the frequency goes up 10x to 1.6 MHz. If now the resistor is cut by 2 to 50 ohms, and we keep the same capacitor, the frequency also goes up by 2, so that if R equals 50 ohms, then the frequency equals 3.2 MHz. Finally, if you increase the capacitance to 3.2 nanofarads, then the combination of R and 50 ohms and 3.2 nanofarads will result in a frequency of 1 MHz. So by scaling, this is how I would get from a frequency of 160 MHz to a frequency of 1 MHz with the appropriate component values. Let's now turn to LTSpice to assign some values to the network and do some performance evaluation. So we're now in the LTSpice environment and I've gone ahead and drawn most of the circuit and left just the key pieces because I want to show you the details of those. So in the schematic that you see right now, all the pieces except for the grounds, the pins, and the diodes are in place. So let's go ahead and add those. So let's start with the grounds. The grounds, there's a shortcut key that would automatically generate the ground. So in my case, it's a G, and I just, just need to just place the grounds at the appropriate nodes. So that's pretty straightforward. For pins, to add pins, you do the same process as adding a label, but then you just need to make a small modification to tell LTSpice such that the label is not a label, but actually a pin. So let's go ahead and bring up the label menu. And in this case, I'm going to add B out. 
And to tell LT Spice that this is a pin, not a label, you hit here. It says port type, rather than say none, you say output. And go ahead and just place it. Uh, let's just repeat for the input. So be in port type input. And just place it. Pins are actually very important because, as I mentioned in my earlier video, the best practice is to do hierarchical design. So pins are crucial for symbols because that's what the symbol will read when making the ports of the symbol. The symbol creating tool will actually ignore labels. All right, so now that we have our pins in, let's add our diodes. To insert our diodes, all you have to do is just hit the shortcut key that bring, that inserts a diode. In my case, it's Control D. I believe the standard key is D. You just uh, orient the diode in the right way and just slot it in. So let me just put the second one and we're done. To select the diode, right click on the diode to bring up the diode menu and then you do pick new diode and just select from the list the one you want. In my case, I'm going to select the 1N4149. This is a little bit more rugged than the 4148 or the 1N914. So for these applications where the diode is going to be a fault diode in a non-signal path location, 4149 is quite appropriate. So let's hit OK and repeat for the second diode. Uh, there you go. 1N49, and I should do it. All right, perfect. So now all the components for the circuit are in place. Next, I like to put, when I have a circuit that is like filters, I like to actually write what the cutoff frequencies are so I remember. So for the low pass filter, we said that we want a 1 megahertz cutoff. So F low pass is 1 megahertz. Let's go ahead and like write it like that. And for the high pass, we say F high pass is equal to, I want 1.6 hertz. There we go. So the 1.6 hertz is way below the hearing frequency range. So the high pass filter will not reject anything that we want to really we actually want to pass through. And the low pass filter is just to cut off any high frequency noise or EMI interference. Okay, so now let's add some values. Let's start with R0. So R0, what it does is it prevents node V in from floating. So this resistor really doesn't matter in terms of uh, being an accurate value. Anything that is big will do in order to not load the source. So anything between 100K and a meg will do. I will probably pick, I think for now, I'm just gonna pick 100K. No, no, it's not very scientific. This is one of the least scientific resistors that we're gonna be picking in this circuit. So there we go, 100K. And actually, let me put the rest. Tolerance for this is probably 5%, and power rating uh, quarter watt will be fine. So there you go. The next one to pick will be R1. And as you can see in the circuit, R1 is in series with the source. So R1 needs to be a small value. I know we haven't talked about noise yet, but what you will find out is that R1 is a huge contributor to noise. So if R1 is too big, we will actually be deteriorating the SNR of the amplifier. So for R1, I like to pick something like 50 ohms. Uh, I noticed actually, I've seen some of the other designs that people have been putting up and they use really big R values of R1, which is, uh, in my opinion, is, is crazy. So just to give you an idea, and we'll, we'll talk more about this when we talk about noise. An R1 of 50 ohms will give you 0.9 nanovolts per root hertz. So if you choose something big, like in the order of say a K, will give you about four nanovolts per root hertz. If you remember from the specs of our amplifier, the spectral noise that we're aiming for is on the order of three and change. So if I go ahead and put something that gives me four, there's I don't even stand a chance of meeting the spec. So 50 ohms is good. 
Also, another thing that I just realized when I was selecting R1 is that if we choose a small value like 50 ohms, when C1 shorts out, which is at a frequency higher than a megahertz, the input impedance of the circuit will actually look like 100k in parallel with 50 ohms, which is literally 50 ohms, right? So the value add of having a 50 ohms input impedance is that now the cable, which is probably also 50 ohms, will be terminated appropriately by R1 and C1. So any EMI that will come in due to reflections or due to poor cable termination is actually solved because, again, the cable will be terminated appropriately with a 50 ohm resistor to ground. So 50 ohms gives, gives us double win. It's a low noise and will also give us termination for the input cable. To finish up with R1, let's go ahead and add the tolerance and the power rating. So for tolerance, I'm going to pick 5%. And by the way, when I say 5%, I actually mean 5% or better. There's no penalty on making the tolerance better than what I'm specifying. I'm just specifying here like the minimum acceptable tolerance. For power rating, this resistor doesn't really see much power. So 0.25 watts should be fine, quarter watt. Now let's look at R2. To select the value of this resistor, the way to think about it is as follows. The source resistance is 50 ohms, typically, at least in most equipment. And we have 50 ohms in series. So the impedance from this node looking to the left is 100 ohms. So this 100 ohms will form a voltage divider with R2 once C2 has shorted out, which is at a frequency above 1.6 hertz. So if we want to have no more than 1% of signal loss between the interaction of R2 and this 100 ohms total source impedance, we want to select R2 to be 100 times larger than this uh, combined source, source impedance. So 100 ohms times 100 is 10K. So that's what I'm going to go with. 10k. Power rating also quarter watt. The signals at these nodes are on the order of a volt RMS, so no need for high value, sorry, not high value, high power resistors. For the tolerance, I'm going to actually not specify it right now because I'm just going to give you a preview. There's going to be an interaction between this resistor and another resistor, so we'll probably select them together. So I'm just going to leave it blank for now. Okay, so now we have R2. Now that we have R2, we have to pay attention to the capacitors. So C1. I actually kind of cheated because I already gave you the answer for C1, but let's just do it together again. So we know our frequency is one megahertz. So let's start using the scaling method. So 1K and one puff is 160 megahertz. So 1K and one nanofarad is 160 kilohertz. So 100 ohms and one nanofarad will be 1.6 megahertz. So 50 ohms and one nanofarad will be 3.2 megahertz. So 50 ohms and 3.2 nanofarads will be one megahertz. And because there actually is no 3.2 nanofarads, we we'll have to pick 3.3, .3, which is, uh, it's fine. So let's go ahead, right click there and write 3.3 .3, uh, nanofarads. Okay, that should be fine. Now for C2, we know we are aiming for a 1.6 Hertz frequency and our resistance is 10K. So let's just do it again. This is actually a bit easier. 1K and 1 picofarads would be 160 megahertz. So 10K and 1 picofarads is 16 megahertz. So 1K and 10, sorry, 10K and 10 picofarads will be 1.6 megahertz. So 10K and 10 microfarads will be 1.6 hertz. So let's pencil it in. 10 microfarads. Finally, before I forget, 
me to actually pick our three. I read in Bob Cordell's book, his recommendation to break ground loops is to use a 4.7 ohm resistor. And I don't have any reason to disagree, so I'm going to go with his recommendation. So 4.7 ohms with a tolerance again of 5% and quarter watt. So let's check on that one. When the diodes are on, the voltage drop between the resistor will be 700 millivolts and the power will be, actually let me pull the calculator for that. The power will be the voltage squared divided by the resistance. So that works out to 100 milliwatts. So quarter watt resistor should be fine. So it's a good idea to check because you never know. So now that we've added our resistor R3, the circuit is complete and we can go ahead and select components. To select components, I'm going to go to the DEQ website. I find it to be quite well stocked with everything we would need. So here's the DEQ website and I'm going to select capacitors. As we said in the previous video, for these capacitors, we want high quality film capacitors, especially for the coupling cap. So I'm going to select here film capacitors. And that should bring us to the filter piece of the website. So let's go ahead and apply our filters. So always a good idea to hit more filters because we're going to filter a bunch of stuff. So first filter to apply, active. We don't want these continued parts. Doesn't make sense. Second, uh, capacitance value. So let's do C2 first, which is 10 microfarads. So let me scroll down and that should be right here. And then finally, let's get our dielectric. For the coupling capacitor, I like to use polypropylene. I think they, they are the highest quality. So let me just select those. So these three. Okay, so now that we set our filters, let's go apply. And we can just go down now to the table. So the electric material, parse status, capacitance should be fine. So now we have all of these and the easiest way to now sort is just by price. You know, no need to pay extra for the stuff that we want to get. So let me sort by price. And I think something like no, I don't like these this one will be fine I will pick this one here it's three bucks so it's not cheap but it's film it's made by Kemet which is a reputable manufacturer it's 10 microfarads 500 volts which is more than what we'll ever need and 10 percent 10 percent is fine so Let's go with this. We even get 5%. So if we can find it, if it's not too much more, and let's see how much it would be for 5%. I think, oh, it's here. Ah, 60 cents, 60 cents for 5%. Ah, hell, why not? So I actually would pick this one. If you're cheap, you can get 10%. So that will save you 60 cents, which is uh, this capacitor right here. So I'm going to store it here, open a new tab. Let's keep it in mind. And now let's look our other capacitor. So for our other capacitor, all we need to do is just now change the capacitance. Let's go remove that filter capacitance right there. And we said we need 3.3 nanofarads, which is 3300 picofarads right there. So apply filter. You see now how the price just drops, which is incredible. So let's see. Uh, 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 uh. This one, cap. One five percent thirty three hundred picofarad radial from TDK. TDK is reputable, so I think I'm gonna go with that five percent. And this one will cost us a whopping. Uh, how where is it? Ah, uh, have to go to there. Nope, 
sorry. So here it doesn't tell us because it's the 6800, but they usually tell you how much you can get it for one. So it's right here. So this one is uh, 50 cents. So though, let's just put a note in our schematic. So just write it down here. DG key. I need to write part number to say PN. It's fine. Is that? Mm, can do something like that. No good. Okay. And then let's just copy this for this capacitor here. Just to remind ourselves what we're doing. So this one is DigiKey part numbers right there. So let's just go ahead and just write it down. So that's it, that's our circuit. So the next step is now to verify the performance doing some simulation. To verify the performance, I'm going to run three simulations. I'm going to look at the frequency response of the network. I'm going to look at the input impedance of the network to make sure that our termination assumption is correct. And then I'm also going to look at the noise. I know noise is something that we haven't discussed and I'm jumping ahead, but why not? Okay, so to do the AC response, first we need to draw our source. So to do that, let me just create a voltage source. Let's put it right here. And let's just wire it in. We need a ground. Okay, and we need to say that the DC voltage is zero, no source impedance, no, no need. And we also need to give it an AC one. So amplitude of one. Okay, so now we got our stimuli. So let me even write, write it down. Now we need our simulation command. So to run an AC, actually the easiest way to do this is uh, right click and say simulation command, select AC analysis. And I like to do decade and 100%, 100 points per decade. Uh, for frequency, let's start low, given that our cutoff frequency is 1.6 Hertz. So let's start really low, 0 0.01. And let's do a stop frequency of 100 megahertz. Okay. So that's our AC command. And now we can just run. So let's see what we get at the output. Uh, face we don't need. So the shape actually looks correct. So let's just now measure the three dB points. To do this, there's two ways. One way is to use the cursors, and the other way is to use a measurement command. So let's start with the cursors, which is the easier way. So to get the cursors, just click and then pull the cursors. So our DC gain or mid band gain, sorry, is. Uh, 0 dB, you can see it right here. So let's now look for the minus 3 dB points. So minus 3 dB is uh, about there. So it's about 1.58 Hertz, which is 1.6, so that's correct. And on the high side, so 970 kilohertz. So that's roughly correct to what we wanted. The reason it's not a megahertz is because we calculated 3.2 nanofarads and we ended up using 3.3. So that puts the frequency a little below, which is fine. So the other way to measure the 3D points is to use a measurement command. I actually pre-wrote it, so let me just add it. Uh, I have it here on my notepad. And let me just talk about how this command works. So what this is saying is, is measure AC and store it in a variable called bandwidth up 
and find in the waveform V out, which is this one, when the magnitude of V out has dropped to 1 over the square root of 2. This last piece, TD equals 1K, is just telling it to start looking at a frequency of 10K. And the reason we need this is because if I start at the beginning, it will actually report the minus 3 dB on the lower side, which is this point. Hence, the second command, bandwidth down, actually is the same command, but doesn't have the starting point specified. So it will start at the beginning and will report this lower part. So let's run the simulation again and look at the error file to see the minus 3 dB points. And you can see it's right here. You can see the up is 960 kilohertz and the bandwidth down is 1.59 or 1.6 uh, hertz. So it's exactly what we calculated and measured before with the cursors. Now let's look at what the input impedance of the network is. To do that, we just need to look at one over the current being drawn from this source because impedance is voltage divided by current, and we know the voltage is one, so it's just one over the current. So let's do that. Let me erase this. Actually, no, let me keep that. Let me add a pane, and I wanna plot on the top pane. So let me add a plot. So it's one over IB1. And there's that. Let's put it in logarithmic. And there is that. So at low frequencies, it's 100K, which is R0. So no surprises there. So that's this piece. Then it drops at 1.6 Hertz to 10 kilo ohms because that's when C2 shorts. So that's right here. And we get essentially R2. And then it drops again and it drops to 50 ohms, which is uh, the value of R1 once uh, C1 starts short, shorting out, which is here. And this is great. This is what we wanted. The 50 ohms will terminate the cable from the that is connected to the source. The 50 ohms will terminate the input cable connected to the socket, and it will prevent any reflections and any EMI from coupling in at very high frequencies. Now let's look at noise. To do noise, we just go to the command window. So I did simulation command, noise, and the output is going to be V or V out, so the output voltage of the network. The input is our input source, and that's for purposes of referring the noise to the input, which we won't do in this uh, circuit, given that the gain is just one. And the rest of the parameters are the same as the AC command. Let's put it in there. I know I'm jumping ahead because we haven't ha talked about noise yet, but just bear with me. To run it, we just do the same thing. We just go ahead and run. Uh, I'm gonna delete the top pane. And for noise, actually, the way you plot it is a little bit different than the AC. So what you do is you look into the Add Traces menu and select O Noise. So that's Voltage Output Noise. Let's plot it and it's right there. And we can see that the shape of the noise that we're seeing at the output is consistent with our circuit. At very low frequencies, when C2 is an open, we're seeing the noise of the 10K ohm resistor, which is on the order of 13 nanovolts per hertz. Then as C2 shorts out, the noise drops to 0.9 nanovolts per hertz, which is the noise of R1. And then as C1 shorts out, when what we're seeing is no noise because all the resistors have been shorted to ground. We'll talk more about noise when we discuss noise in a future video. Now that we have tested our circuit, this concludes the LT spy section of this video. Now that we have finished the design of the input network, selected the gain, and chosen the power supply rails, here's the amplifier thus far. Note that I have made some changes to what we just did a minute ago. As you know, design is an iterative process. First, I bumped the gain from 34.6 to 35 to account for the 1% gain loss in the input network. Second, I increased R1 to 75 ohms since RCA cables are actually 75 ohms and not 50. And third, 
I decrease C1 to 680 picofarads from 3.3 nanofarads. While this increases the nominal cutoff frequency to 3 MHz, which by the way is still fine, it allows the amplifier to be connected to higher output impedance preamps without low passing any signal in the hearing range. For example, two preamps have an output impedance of 600 ohms to 1K. Therefore, with the capacitance change, the cutoff frequency is still above 200 kHz. In the next videos, I will do an introduction to the fundamental concepts of feedback and will demonstrate how to measure loop gain using LT Spice. If you like the content of this video and want to get notified when the next video is available, please show your support to this channel by subscribing and hitting the thumbs up button for this video. Thanks for watching, until next time, goodbye friends.